Well, uh, I'm going to read the Bible, and then I'm going to do my best to explain it, unpack it, apply it, land the plane, conclude, hand this back to uh, Pastor Andrew, and uh, we're just going to get things started. It is going to be two and a half days that I honestly believe have the potential to alter the trajectory of your life. I really believe that. I got no other reason to be here but to believe that your course can be altered and you can become more like Jesus. You can find more fulfillment and more purpose and more meaning in this life because of the few hours we spend together. We have not come here because uh, we're looking for confetti. We have come here because we need Jesus. The confetti is an awesome bonus, but uh, we are here for Jesus. And I honestly believe that your life can be changed. I just out of sheer curiosity, anyone here you were born in 1997? I'd just like to, wow. The year I graduated high school. Anyone born in 98? This is getting increasingly depressing. 99, anyone born in 99? Anyone born in 2000? I will not go any further than 2000. I will not go any further than 2000. All right, turn with me to a story in uh, the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 10. We're going to read this one passage. And we're going to backtrack, go to the beginning of time, the creation account, and then we're gonna, we'll end back in this particular passage. Um, it's going to be good. You pumped? Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. By the way, I am a card-carrying member of Portland Bible College, and I have a degree, and I just want to thank Portland Bible College. All over the world now, Pastor Ken Malman, wherever you are, they ask me if I have a degree. Thank God I do. A degree from Portland Bible College, an amazing school, which uh, if you're 12, start planning now. If you were born in 2008, start planning now. Okay, Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. One thing is necessary. I want to, uh, I'm going to title uh, this talk, Home Sweet Home. Home Sweet Home. Turn to the person next to you and say, are you too good for your home? <laughs> Don't act like you even know what that movie is. You're born in 2009. <laughs> Can somebody throw me a water bottle? Just throw it right at me. Just, oh, I think that's used. But I, you, <laughs> thanks, man. I know, you're such a good man. I, I hope that's not a sign for Sunday. You know, <laughs> throw me more. <laughs> Everybody throw your water bottles. Okay. JK, JK, LOL. Ha -ha. Okay. Just trying to relate to kids, young people. <laughs> home sweet home. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thanks for the moments now. We, just, we dedicate this space right now to uh, be of one heart and one mind as we come together around your word. God, we know it's living, it's alive, it's active, it's breathing, it's speaking right now. Speak to us in a real, genuine, and authentic way. God, I thank you for every young person in this room as it has already been prayed throughout this evening. I'm asking, Lord, that you would encounter us, your goodness, your grace, your love. We thank you, Lord, uh, for your favor on the Seattle Seahawks. We are asking collectively, 3,000 strong, we have come together with one heart and one mind that you would favor your righteous cause, which is the Seattle Seahawks. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Yeah, it is good to be home in the Northwest. Anybody have uh, parents or friends, or maybe even as a teenager, you travel a lot? Any, any frequent flyers, frequent travelers? Wow, really? Awesome. Um, I travel a fair bit, and I, 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 I love where I go. I just don't like 
uh, uh, the, the route to getting there. I can't stand flying, okay? I fly a lot. I, I literally, part of my family is the Alaska Airlines like, like employees, okay? Part of my life belongs to Alaska Airlines. Um, I see them every Wednesday now. Every Wednesday and every Friday, I get on the same tube. It takes me up into the sky and takes me home, back and forth from LA and Seattle. So as a result, uh, I spend a lot of time uh, tra tra traveling, and I, and I hate it. I, I cannot stand Air, 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 airplanes, okay? I, I can't stand the bathrooms in airplanes. I got this issue, like I can't get anything on my clothes, I can't get anything on my hands. I always carry hand sanitizer. Like we're probably gonna shake hands after tonight and I'm gonna say hello and the first thing I'm gonna think about when I shake your hand is where your hand has been, just to be honest. Okay, I, 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 can't, I can't do, so, so I love going places but there is no place like home. I love home. How many of you have your own bedroom? Let me hear this. Oh, hello, hashtag blessed. My kids share a bedroom. We literally have, we, they have one bedroom. I have three kids, for those that don't know. 10, Zion's 10, L-Dog is eight. My favorite of the three, my daughter, five, Grace. And they have a three-decker bunk bed, one room. Yeah, pray for us, okay? We don't have like multiple rooms like you guys out here, okay? How many share a room, room sharers? Let's honor the room sharers. This is, yeah, if you're married, please raise your hand. Yeah, funny, Chris, real funny. I'm trying to preach up here, okay. There's nothing like your own space. Can we talk about this for a second? I don't know where this is gonna go, but let's just talk about it. Let's just relax, okay? Everybody just slow down and relax. There's nothing like your own space space, okay? I can't, I'm flying here from Los Angeles this morning, and I'm flying in, and the man next to me, bless his soul. You know when people say bless his soul in church? That means you crazy. Bless his soul. He, he just, he, you ever have met one of the people, they talk to you right here, and his breath, he was flying in from Shanghai, and his breath smelled like he had been on the plane for two days. And he's like, what are you doing in Portland? And I'm like, oh gosh, I, don't, I like my personal space. I don't want to smell anybody's breath at all, right? Like, and, and the older I get, the worse this is getting. It's not improving, okay? So I love when I come home. Do you, does your home have a particular smell? Now, if you think it doesn't, you are one of those homes. Now, growing up, there was this family, and every time I went over to their house, I was always like, are you guys cooking fish? Because it smells like fish. And they'd be like, no. I'm like, but it smells like fish. You guys are having fried fish tonight. Did you ever have one of those friends, and you leave their house, and you come home, and you smell like fried fish? Everybody has one of those friends. Their house just smells like fish. Okay, that's not my house. I'm a candle crazy. I got candles everywhere, and I'm lighting candles, and if you come in smelling like fish, I'm gonna spray you with Febreze. <laughs> but I like, I like my house. It's, it's got my musk. It's got my smell. It's got like, 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 someday, ladies, you're gonna get married, and your husband is going to need to have a place where he, you think it's unintentionally where he drops his shoes or he drops his bag, but I'm just telling you, a grown man needs, sometimes it's in the middle of the room, but he needs space to just put his shoes right there. And he just needs you to be okay with that. Yeah, this is grown man talk, this is grown man talk. So I wanna put my bag where I want, it's my house. I am the king of my castle. Chelsea gave me approval to say that. I. I'm in charge. I, I just love my house. I love the smell. That's my space. There's nothing like being home. It just gives me sanity. Okay, you travel too much. You just need to come home to home. One of the most underrated things about home, can we talk about this, is your own toilet. <laughs> Even if you share a toilet right now, someday you're going to get grown and have enough money to buy your own toilet, okay? And can I just say, there is nothing like, don't look at me like I can't believe he's talking about this. Please believe, okay? But when I come home and it's my own toilet, I'm like, that's my toilet, man. I don't use seat covers on my toilet. Now I use seat covers everywhere else. Can we talk about seat colors? I mean, seat covers. Can we talk, they're all white, but can we talk about seat covers? Have you ever used a seat cover? I had somebody tell me like, oh, that's what those are for? 
what were you using them for, bro? Like, do you know how many behinds have been on that toilet in the airport? Like, come on, man. But I, so I, and, and if there's no seat cover, I build my own with the toilet paper, right? You guys do this, right? This is what makes us American, okay? Have you ever, have you ever like, you had to build your own seat cover and you gotta go so bad and you're like, oh God, oh Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you put it, because what ends up happening is, is your body gets close to the proximity of the toilet and it says, let's go. And you're like, whoa, not yet. We got to sanitize so I don't die. But has this ever happened to you? You're like putting the TP and, and then you like, you go to sit down and it slips and falls in and you're like, oh, Oh no, and you gotta start all over. This is real, this stuff happens to real people. You know the seat cover has that little tongue in the middle and you're supposed to like break it apart and, and, and then they say what you do is you, you, you undo the tongue in the middle of the cover and you drop it just gently on the water. So when you're done, you flush it and it, the tongue just takes the cover down. Don't do that, man. Because that tongue, it always, it, in the worst, in, most inconvenient, it just takes the cover away. So you got to rip it all the way out and put it in. And just leave the cover for the next guy. He's going to need it, right? Like, <laughs> I love going home. No seat covers at home. That's my house. That's my spot. You, you need, there's something in the psyche. There's something in the human condition. You just need your own space. Come on, we've all been there. No matter how old you are, you are 12 years old. But every once in a while, no matter how, what a social butterfly you are, you just like, mom, dad, friends. I just, just give me some space. I just need some space. I just, I just gonna go into my bedroom or to my bunk bed and to the closet, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I am just going to get some space of my, of my own. I literally, this, this is how my brain works. I'm on an airplane, ironically enough, and I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about, man, I miss home. I love home. I would go crazy if I couldn't go home frequently. I need home. Home is essential. Home is important. In fact, I want to go home right now. I don't want to go where I'm going. I miss home. I need more home. I'm going to be home more. I want to be home more. I'm tired of not being home. Like I'm having this whole conversation with myself, right? I talk to myself. Don't, you don't know what I've been through. Don't judge me, okay? So, like, I'm talking to myself, and, and then I start thinking. That's amazing. If my, if my physical state needs a home, needs a place, my own space for my own habitation and my own sanity and my own peace and clarity, I wonder if my, if my soul needs to go home. And here's a human condition that I want us to address just for a second, and I want us just to be honest. Let's just collectively put our heads together and consider the fact that there is a phenomenon on our hands in, in the world today, and the fact is we have restless people living today. Notice how restless everybody is? Everybody's restless. Go to an airport. Go to the mall. Go to Disneyland. It's the happiest place on earth, and everybody's ugly, mean, and angry. Everybody is just restless, so much. It's an epidemic of restlessness in our culture, in our society. Some of you right now, you're having a hard time focusing because you're restless. Can't calm down. Uh, uh, media is not helping. It's perpetuating the problem. We can't pause, we can't get quiet, we can't get alone, we're inundated and we are living in this condition that is not ideal, optimal, and it's certainly not sustainable. You're living in this restless state and you're always going and you're always moving and you are internally nomadic. Never coming home. Never finding sanity and clarity and rest and peace. Now, we've got an opportunity tonight to accomplish something very significant, maybe more than you realize. I'm 36 years old, not as young as I used to be. But if you can learn at 12, 16, 19, how to go home on the inside, you will be a healthy 36 year old. But if you continue down this trail and pathway of this nomadic internal state, restlessness, eventually you end up, well here's some of the symptoms making really dumb decisions with your life. 
living by instinct and impulse, which is by nature animalistic, because you are restless and you are looking for anything to just ease the restlessness you feel. You just can't get peace, you can't get quiet, you can't get calm, and so you end up acting out. You end up making ridiculous decisions when you are confronted about the decision, you look at the person and they go, why did you do that? And you go, oh. And they reason with you and you go, I know, so stupid. Why did you do it? Because if you do not frequent home, it messes with your makeup. Think about how much, think about a nomadic person physically, tangibly, with no roof over their head. Think about how it affects their psychological, think about how it affects their overall existence and well-being. There is a home for your soul. The Bible reveals this, and this, this is where we're gonna go, okay? Just bear with me. When is the last time your soul went home? Here's why a lot of you showed up to Jen Unleashed. Because when you come here, some of you year after year, you come here, and when these songs are being sung, and everybody's like raising hands and singing, you're like, I just like the vibe. It just, I don't know, it just feels good. I just like it. Well, what's happening is something on the inside is experiencing what your mind and body experiences when you come to your home. You know, when you've been out at the mall just kicking it with your friends and all of a sudden you just, you get home, you walk into your bedroom and you're like, <sighs> and you lay on your bed, you're like, oh my gosh, he talked to me. <laughs> I didn't even know he was going to be at Abercrombie and he was there. No one goes to Abercrombie. You know, like, I... I can't believe it. And you're just like, you're in your bedroom. Someone comes in, you're like, get out, it's my bedroom. <laughs> you probably shouldn't talk like that, but we all get the point. You need your space. You, th you, you think your external home's important? Do you know how imperative your internal home is? If my soul has a home, let's ask an imperative question that will dramatically affect your life's existence. This is pretty imperative, this is pretty important stuff. If there's a home for my soul, when's the last time my soul was there? When's the last time I was home? All right, let's go back to Genesis, the beginning of time, okay? God makes man, his name, Adam. Genesis chapter two and verse seven. Let me read this to you. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Glad we established that. Now, listen to this, Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Okay, let's talk about this for a I'm gonna take my jacket off because it's mad hot in here. Well, nobody touched that jacket, okay? So God, here's how the story goes, okay? God makes Adam, and he makes his form, visible form, you can see it. So Adam, as best we can tell, he, he doesn't have any clothes on, but we're not gonna reenact that part. And he's standing there, and he's like this. The Bible says God formed him, but he wasn't living yet. He had a shell, he had lips, hips, fingertips, eyeballs, and ears, but he was not activated. When did the first human come alive? The Bible says when God breathed into his nostrils. So it went something like, Adam standing like this, God breathed in, he went, <sighs> and Adam was, Alive. We have on our hands for the very first time a human being. He's alive. But notice, he is not alive until the breath of God enters his form. Now, you may not be familiar with this, but the ancient Hebrews, this is what they believe. They believe that the most essential characteristic of the human soul was God's breath 
which is to say, how do you define the soul? It's so ambiguous, it's so difficult. Scholars and writers and thinkers and uh, philosophers have gone on and on in their writings and discussions of what is the human soul and how do you define the human soul? Ancient Hebrews believed that basically the essence of the human soul was the breath of an infinite divine creator. I want you to think, the very first time the human system was activated, it was God breathing out and a human breathing in. Hebrew, the ancient Hebrews believe, and still many Jewish people teach today, that we are all living on borrowed breath. That you have in your system right now, as you sit and as you speak, as average and ordinary as you and I look, we are literally have within us the breath of the infinite, divine, all-powerful, all-knowing creator God pulsating his breath we carry in our beings. Now, you're like, wow, that's crazy. Oh, it's more crazy than you think. I'll prove it to you. Do you remember this one story where Jesus, in Luke chapter 19, Jesus gets on this donkey. It's crazy how they get the donkey there and everything. It's exactly how Jesus said. And the disciples bring the donkey, the little colt, and Jesus rides that little dude into Jerusalem, okay? And he's riding it in, and everybody's there going, hallelujah. We pray, God, Jesus, you are God. You are God, right? Well, the religious teachers, they hear people talking about he's God, hallelujah, you're the king, kings, you're Messiah, you're everything. And they say, hey, hey, Jesus. They pull him aside. They're like, that's cool, man, little, the cult thing. But real quick, do you hear them? He said, what? They're calling you. <laughs> They're calling you God, man. You're not God. You need to tell them to be quiet. Jesus says something. It, a lot of these scenarios happen and Jesus says stuff and it's easily missable because it's real simple. He's like, oh, you don't know how this whole thing works, do you? They're like, what? <laughs> you, don't, you don't get it, do you? How foundational the, the, the worship is. If I can't find human soul or breath to sing out my praise, um, that rock will grow lips, gums, and tongues, and praise me. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, that, that's how foundational. Uh, John Calvin said, all of creation is a theater for God's glory and praise and worship. He, Jesus says, I'm sorry, you, <laughs> you don't get it. If I can't find a human, the trees will start singing. What? It's kind of all set up for that. It's kind of like wired into the system. This actually is all for, how do I say this? Me! <laughs> whoa. Yeah, whoa. Charles Spurgeon said, maybe the piece of literature in all of scripture that without peer is Psalms 103. Psalms 103 by many writers and thinkers is described as the whole Bible in one song. Psalms predominantly written by the great ancient King David. It's lyrics, it's beats, it's harmonies, it's melodies, it's soul, it's heart, it's all on paper, it's divine, inspired by God. And Psalms 103 has exactly 22 verses, which is exactly the number of the Hebrew alphabet. And guess how Psalms 103 starts and ends? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So, what, what's going on there? 22 verses, starts and ends, as if God is going, this is kind of where life starts, and well, this is kind of where life ends. Life is about what? Ultimately one thing, your soul blessing the Lord. Now, about this point, you're like, awesome. How do you, how do you bless the Lord with your soul? <laughs> the word bless means to gratefully, affectionately praise. The word soul, now you see soul and I see soul, but the Hebrew mind, the Jewish mind sees soul and oftentimes interchanges it with breath. What David is writing is he's saying gratefully, thankfully, praise God, breath. Because in that space and in that place, you will find what you were made for. Now about this time, you're like, oh, that's cool, man. No, we, I guess we need to sing more. Right? We better start singing. It's a good message on singing, Judah. It's a little bit more than that. 
well, I better, better get that CD that's coming out, you know, I wanna make sure I sing some more, it's good, it's so good. Uh, first of all, the benefit that this is going to grant you is imperative for you to sit for a second and consider. When you use your borrowed breath and give it back to God, something on the inside goes, oh, that felt good. What was that? You just came home. Oh man, I like the vibe in here. Woo, man, this band is really good at singing. Wow, this, this, this speaker, like this is where the speaker compliments himself subtly. This speaker's amazing. <laughs> Love this guy. What a great dresser. <laughs> like, okay, pastor, that's enough. But you can't explain the feeling you're getting. You just came home for a second. You just came home. You, you were made for this. You don't, understand, you don't understand the implications. When you go, love you, Jesus, something inside of you goes, whoo, yes. Let's say that again. God, I love you. Good morning. You're beautiful. Something inside of you is like, whoo. yeah. Let's breathe in again, and let's do that again. You were... You were made for that, I'll prove it again. Psalms 150, it's the very last song in the great ancient collection of songs. The book of, the, the word psalm means songs. Psalms 150 in verse six, the final, the final verse in all of the psalms. Here is its pinnacle conclusion. Here's the zenith conclusion of all of the songs ever written. Do you know how it climax, you know the climactic conclusion in Psalms 150 in verse six? Guess what it says? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I want you to think about that. That to me, that verse seems to reverberate throughout the corridors of history and each generation is presented with an opportunity. Let everything that has breath, guess what does not have the breath of God? Animals. Guess what does not have the breath of God? Trees and rocks. Guess what is the pinnacle of his creation? The living, breathing, human soul. David is not saying, sing more. Come on, Christians, sing. You're not singing enough. Now, if you've been in church for any length of time, you understand that praise is the upbeat songs we do in church. And so some of you have been in church, like me, for so long, when you see the word praise, you're like, we need some more fast songs. <laughs> uh, not really. The word praise there is not just about singing. It's about thinking. It's about conversing. It's about meditating. It's about talking. It's about painting. It's about writing. It's about creating. It's about using your borrowed breath and angling it and pointing it and positioning it back to praise God. And the Bible is making a promise that when you use the breath for the ultimate reason for which you received it, there is something inside of you that comes alive and there is a buoyancy and there is a health and there is a meaning and there is a purpose and there is satisfaction. Let everything that has breath, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. That's your home. That's what you were made for. Let's not complicate this. It's really simple. You want to go the long haul? Jen Unleashed was never designed so that you'd, you know, have goose pimples for two and a half days. <laughs> it's so good. It was about empowering you to live the rest of your days on this earth fulfilled with purpose and meaning and clarity. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So that's my introduction. This is my conclusion. This brings us to this, uh, 
this really fun, beautiful, and slightly confusing story. We read it a moment ago. Jesus is with the family, the, the family that is closest to him other than his natural family, Mary, Martha, and they have a little brother named Lazarus. He's got a pretty amazing story. Mary and Martha are, now remember, they're in a home. It's their home. Mary and Martha live there. They invite Jesus over to their home. Operative word, home. In this home, something natural and yet extraordinary unfolds. Martha, the older sister, naturally, probably the one who pays the bills, probably the one who actually cleans the house, who's actually responsible, who actually is not the random abstract artist, okay? Martha actually gets stuff done. She goes into the kitchen to prepare hummus, pita bread for Jesus. <laughs> Meanwhile, the artist, the free spirit Mary, <laughs> is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Can't you just see her, right? She, she's, she's, just like, she's just like, oh, Jesus, I love you. This is so good. Martha's in the kitchen like, oh my gosh, do something with your life. <laughs> you know these personalities, come on, right? And Mary's just like hanging on every word. We don't know what Jesus is saying. We don't know. We're not, we're not privy to the conversation. We just know that finally it reaches total insanity for Martha. And she storms into what is probably the living room. She walks in and she's like, really? Really? Really, Jesus? She's doing nothing. I'm doing everything. Now this is so, this is so sister, brother, sibling stuff. It's so manipulative and it's so um, not direct. She's telling Jesus, but Mary's right there. Tell her, I won't speak to her, tell her to come help me. I will not look at her, but I will tell you. So you tell her right now, please tell her. I won't look at her. Tell her to help me. It's like, she's right there, Martha. Talk to her yourself. But that's what we do as siblings, right? Mom, tell him right now to stop it. He's like right there. Now, before we go any further, because some of you, you've read this story before, you know how it ends, okay? It's pretty logical. I would like to stop for a second and say, Martha's not crazy. She kind of makes sense. She's actually doing something with her life, right? We're Americans and Canadians. Holla! Go hockey! So, no, I love hockey. I mean, I will, eventually. So, I'm trying so hard. So, can, can, can we be honest? Like, I kind of get Martha. Like, she's like, how about you put your big girl pants on, Mary, and you actually, I don't know, get productive with your life. How about you consider that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lion and the Lamb, the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley is in our living room. And it would be helpful to, oh, I don't know, serve him. <laughs> Martha gets all the bad rap in churches around the world. Don't be Martha, be Mary. Oh, don't be the person actually doing something. Be Mary, the free spirit. <laughs> Can we just celebrate the Marthas in the world that have actually done something? <laughs> Thanks, Martha. Thank you. Thank you. Back to our scene. She's like, uh-huh, so could you tell her? Now right about now, if you're new to the story, you're thinking Jesus is gonna say, Mary, she's got a point, okay? <laughs> you, you don't do a lot, do you? <laughs> you just wanna paint, don't you? And, Listen to music, yeah, oh, you're so cute. Get up now and serve me. <laughs> That's how most of us would see this going. Jesus looks at the woman who says, Mary needs to serve you and needs to actually do something. And Jesus goes, watch this, he goes, he addresses the inside. He goes, you, you're worried and troubled about many things. 
He's not saying your hair is disheveled and your outfit is horrible today. <laughs> he goes past the hair and the outfit and he addresses the condition of her soul. He says, you, you, you're really restless, aren't you? You, you? You're disheveled on the inside, aren't you? You're in there paying the bills and cleaning the kitchen and serving and whipping up hummus, but you're, you, you're worried. You're anxious about a lot of things. Think about that time. Martha's like, what did I just walk into? What did I do? But no question, Jesus just nails the state of her soul. And he continues. He says, um, Martha, I'm not going to tell Mary to do that. What? I'm not going to tell her to help you in the kitchen. Prepare me food. I'm, I'm not going to help. I'm not going to tell her. In fact, Mary has chosen, listen to his words now. Now, I look at this scene and, I, and I'm thinking, Jesus, you should have saved this material for the masses. This is good stuff. Why share this with two sisters in a living room? What about the 4,000? What about the 5,000? You need to get your good material out to the public. <laughs> like, I read this and Jesus goes, the one thing that is necessary. I read this and I'm like, are we, Jesus, are we doing this right now? Are you about to bottom line human existence in a living room with two sisters? You gotta get this in a book so we can get it to the nations. You don't do it here. Wait to bottom line all of life for the masses. I wonder why Jesus chose the context of home to bottom line why you are even here. Martha comes in with human logic that most of us have signed up for. Life is about what you do, how you serve, preparing. You know, you gotta do something. And I am gonna show Jesus how much I love him because I am baking in here and I have got, I've got drinks and everything. Where is Mary? Because I am going to praise the Lord. I am gonna, I am gonna read my Bible through four times this year. I am never gonna miss church. I am gonna give so much money in the basket every Sunday. I am going to, look at that person, they don't do anything. <laughs> I don't even have a Bible. I am going to be somebody who does something for God. She comes in and she's livid. And most of us are like, oh, Martha, you got a bad attitude. No, most of us are Martha. What are we talking about? Hello? We want to guilt people into doing stuff. Guess who's restless in their soul? Not the free spirit, random abstract artist at the feet of Jesus. She's just as happy as can be. Martha, you, you're restless. There is one thing necessary in all of life. Wait for it. This is crazy. I promise I'm ending right here. Someone can come on the Yamaha. This is it right here. That's the piano. He says, one thing is necessary. Now, right about here, I'm reading this, and I'm like, he's about to tell us. He's about to tell us. One thing is necessary. Okay, Jesus, tell us. And Mary has chosen the good part. <sighs> what? What does that mean? Do you read your Bible like this? I'm like, you didn't? Okay, what is Mary doing? Because whatever Mary is doing is why we're here. She's not doing anything. Where's the logic, Jesus? Tell us what she was doing. He doesn't. What was she doing? This is what she was doing. I love you, I love you so much. The one thing that's essential in life is to do not what Martha was doing, but what Mary's doing? What's Mary doing? 
<laughs> She's listening to Jesus. She's engaging with Jesus. I was a youth pastor for a decade. Basically, I'm still a youth pastor. Don't, can I just level with you? Don't hang your hat on all you're gonna do for God. If you do some of those things, that's great. But I don't want you to be 45, 50, 60 years old and find yourself going, so is this it? Got a great job, I was faithful in church, I did all these, did all this stuff for God. I built orphanages and traveled to mission fields and nations and I, I, I don't know, I just kinda was hoping for more and found people that weren't doing anything and told them they needed to you know, get to work and I kind of thought in all those camps and conferences and retreats and conventions that I thought like if you, if you dedicated your life to do stuff for God that at the end of your life you'd be, I don't know, maybe happy, fulfilled. I wonder if in all of our working and all of our doing, have we forgot to go home? Have we been so busy in the kitchen? We don't spend time in the living room anymore with Jesus. Is this what we're gonna do? We're just gonna architect our life. God, I'm gonna be busy for you. I'm gonna do all these great things for you. And life will go like this, young person. It'll be over before you know it. What are we gonna make life about? Your social status, your feats, your accomplishments, your resume, your biography, how many Twitter followers you have, how much money you have in your checkings and savings account. So we busy ourselves for 40 years working for Jesus in the kitchen and we missed the essence of life, which is actually not doing and not going, it's being. We stand here at Jen Unleashed, and I think sometimes we think, oh, these songs are great, the preaching's great, but I wanna go, you know, do something for God, and I applaud that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm a church builder, I'm a pastor. I believe in that, but it's not the one thing that's necessary, is it? And I don't want you to be 60 years old and go, but I thought they told me that if I did all this, that I would, When's the last time you felt a, a draw from God? You felt an inclination or an indication that he was kind of moving in on your space. Maybe you were at school, maybe you were at the car, maybe you're walking the mall, maybe you're walking your dog, maybe you're just getting up in the morning, getting ready for school, but your spirit's alive for those of you that are Jesus followers, and all of a sudden you feel that pull, and you feel that moment. I am telling you, do what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said to do. Do what Charles Spurgeon preached about. He said, the moment you feel an inclination, the moment you feel draw from your creator, act upon it immediately, drop what you're doing and lean into that space for that is why you are here. When's the last time you went home? I didn't say go to church. I didn't say tell your friend about Jesus. I said when is the last time you did what Mary did? When's the last time you just reveled in his love? When's the last time you put away all the distractions and you just quieted your mind and your heart and you uttered words like, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, I want you. Jesus, I need you. When's the last time you stopped talking and said, now you talk, Jesus? I did not sign up. I did not sign up just to do things for God. I signed up to follow Jesus because I want a relationship. And if there is a God, I want to know him to the maximum length, to the most extreme level. I don't want to spend my life in the kitchen when Jesus is in my living room. She chose the one thing. What is she doing? Not a lot, is she? Guess who Jesus was pleased with? Mary. He loved looking at Mary. She's gone, 
Just keep talking, Jesus. Oh, you're amazing. I love you so much. Thank you. Let life flow from there. What will you do? I don't know. At the end of your life, you won't have your resume on your deathbed, but you will have your relationship with God and thank you, the relationship with people in your world, just friends. God, I don't want my tombstone to say he built this and he went there and he had these feats and accomplishments. Nobody cares. All that matters is, did I ever sit at his feet? Do you feel restless? Do you feel anxious? Do you feel troubled? Do you feel worried about many things? Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise clearly is not just singing, it's reveling, it's watching, it's listening, it's meditating, it's thinking, it's letting yourself lean into God. And in that space, something inside of you goes, I'm home, I'm home. This is what I've always been looking for. <laughs> I end with this, I promise I'm done. The piano's playing softly, this is it. We lead a community in LA, in the last couple of years it's grown dramatically and a young man from a Jewish family shows up on the front row and he invited by a friend and he had all the doubts in the world, you know, and he sat there and I don't know what I preached that night and hopefully it was just about Jesus, you know, and he came, um, he came forward at the end and he decided to accept Jesus his Jewish Messiah. He decided in one night that his Messiah had come. And for some of you, you don't understand the implications of that, but when you were raised Jewish to believe that your Messiah is still to come, only to discover in a hotel in Beverly Hills that your Messiah indeed has come and you have been saved and you have been rescued, something inside of him began to burst and he came up to me and I said, I said, well, what's going on? He's like, I'm in. Jesus is my Messiah. And tears started coming down his face. I said, how do you know? He goes, I just know. I'm home, he said. I'm home. I said, yeah, you are. Welcome home. And I highly recommend you go home regularly and let life just flow from there. Let life just flow from there and watch the 60-year-old you'll be someday. <laughs> People will say, what do you do for a living? Ah, I did this, I did that. I, yeah, something about you, I just... So in love with Jesus, you know? That's what I want. When I believe deep in the core of your being, that's what you want. And so it's yours. We can go home right now, by the way. It's not difficult. It's not hard. God is not unreachable. God is not trying to avoid you. He's moved into your living room, and he's available. Just get out of the kitchen and come in and just go, okay, Jesus, don't complicate it. As the music begins to play, let's come home just for a few minutes. And then I'm going to give an opportunity for those who'd like to accept and follow Jesus, maybe for the very first time. But just right now, right where you're sitting, just close your eyes just for a second, just for concentration and privacy. And as the team just sings the song, I want you to go home. I want you to let yourself sit at his feet. Let yourself just imagine Jesus talking to you, interacting with you. Come on, let's go home. Let's go home. This is what you were made for. This is what you were designed for. Let everything that has breath. Jesus.